Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heather Bryan, Education Specialist with EducationProjects.org. On behalf of our client, Ohio Corn and Wheat, I would like to welcome you all to the Water Quality Virtual Lesson. We're excited for this opportunity to partner with the Ohio Department of Education to bring you the Feed and Fuel Your Future Virtual Learning Series. This series is a four-week series connecting science through the lens of agriculture. This week, our topics are focused on sustainability and ecosystems. In addition to this water quality virtual lesson today, we will be offering a chance to explore career options with students through the interactive career panel on Thursday, tomorrow. Members for that interactive career panel are Heather Raymond. Heather Raymond is the director for the Water Quality Initiative for Ohio State University, Logan Hockey and Paige Fitzwater who specialize in the 4R Nutrient Stewardship Program through Legacy Co-op in Northwestern Ohio. Today, we're gonna to take a look at Feed the World, the Ohio Corn and Wheat's education program where we focus on engaging students with important issues such as sustainability, water quality, soil health, biotechnology, and energy production. Let's take a look at this webpage really quickly so that you can see where you can find the curriculum that we'll be using today in our lesson. Please see um, at Ohio Corn Education, excuse me, OhioCornEducation.org, where you can go to the curriculum button here at the top of the page. This will take you directly to Feed the World. And you can see here that there are several lessons that are on the side. Today specifically, we'll be using the lesson Can You ID, as well as biotic water sampling and additional tests that you could do, but we will not do today are chemical testing and the water quality conclusion. Other things that you can use in your classroom today are um, the resources that you see down here at the bottom right hand of the page. So streaming the macroinvertebrate identification cards, the Aquabugs mobile app, and kick saning. Those are different um, resources that you can use to help you identify your macroinvertebrates and remember kick staining techniques to make the experience more uh, beneficial for your students. All right, we're gonna move on here to the next page. Give me just one second. Here we go. Oh gosh. Some technical difficulties here. All right, one of the things that I'm really excited about today is to highlight one of our um, great Feed the World alumni teachers, Mr. Jostable. So Mr. Jostable and his class helped me to create this lesson for everybody today. We're gonna take a look really quickly at the All Glaze River where you can see um, some good water quality behind you. The water looks a little brown, um, it's turning just a little bit. And so you can see, you can see that we're going to take a look and assess the water quality this way. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, one of the things that we're going to do today is to take stock of the life inside of this river. This is the Auglaize River in Putnam County. And we're here today um, with my friend Jeff Jostical, who is a Feed the World alumni, and two of his students. I'm going to let you guys, in, or Mr. Jostical, introduce you guys. This is Nathan Seals and Jake Worst, and they are both involved in the environmental science programs at school and are here to help us today. So we have two awesome students from Fort Jennings High School here to help us today, and they're gonna help us take stock of this um, river and determine what kind of water quality we think we have here. So this river is primarily um, a beautiful river. It has shade cover, so the riparian zone, it looks like, has beautiful grasses, so there's um, good cover to help shade the river. It looks like the water is flowing pretty nicely. It looks pretty clean to me. So I don't know, if I were to look at a river like this, I might think, hey, that's a pretty good water quality. But just looking at a river doesn't really mean that the water quality is good. So one of the things that we're going to do today is to search around for some of the things that live inside the river, the macroinvertebrates, so that we can determine if they're in macroinvertebrates that are sensitive or tolerant to pollution. And that'll help us to determine whether or not the river is good water quality or poor water quality today. 
Okay. So how do we do that, Mr. Jaspel? Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to find a spot in the river where you're most likely to find the macroinvertebrates. And that is called a riffle area. You want some place where you've got the water churning and the oxygen that they are all requiring. They're hiding in the rocks, they're hiding underneath the rocks, and the percentage of oxygen is going to be higher when it's being stirred up, just like an aerator in a pond. So luckily for us, we have this kind of broken up low head dam here, what's left of it, and we should be able to see quite a few macroinvertebrates in that oxygenated water there. Okay, so what are some things that might cause us not to see macroinvertebrates? Um, we're in a very rural area. This is a farming area. Um, it's possible that we could have contamination from fertilizers, and not just from farms, but also from lawns in the area. Um, there could be pesticides that have also washed in from, again, lawns and homeowners along with agriculture. Um, it could be sediment from farming practices or, or construction. construction or places along the bank where trees have been cleared. And the sediment is deadly to the macros, of course, because it smothers them. It takes their, their, their little habitat away from under the rocks and it fills in those spaces where they live. Um, it could be from temperature, um, but we do have shade. Um, so a lot of these macroinvertebrates were probably in one of the most perfect spots we could find on the Ogles River, to be honest. Yeah. Um, other things to consider is it is a very cool autumn day. So right now it's about 64 degrees outside, which is actually really marvelous. But it's a beautiful sunny day. And so we are kind of coming to the end of our summer cycle too. Okay. All right, so these young gentlemen and I and Mr. Joshua are going to demonstrate how to kick sand. So in order to collect macroinvertebrates, it's really important that you um, get prepared in the correct way. Would you show them your kick sand for me? All a kick sand is is a very fine net that water can go through that's usually weighted on the bottom so that it stays um, kind of held against the bottom and the water will rush into it and it will help to capture the macroinvertebrates that we're looking for. As we kick, into the net. which means to take up the stones, move them around with your feet, brush them up with your hands, and get all those macroinvertebrates that are hiding to wash into the water and into the net. Yes. So what are some, before we walk out into the water, what should we be doing? Well, you can either use one person or two people to hold the kick sink net. You want to move in from downstream so that you're not affecting what's going to wash in the net. So you want to come in from downstream, and we usually have a three by three area that you just sort of guesstimate. And then you will kick sink. You will kick the rocks, you will stir up the sediment, you'll pick up the rocks and brush them off because some of those little critters will actually adhere to the underside of the rocks. Um, there's possibly crayfish and fish that will be able to flow into the net too and we'll capture everything that was coming in that three by three foot square and then analyze what we found. And then we'll scoop it up to capture it all and we're going to take it up here to observe the macro invertebrates. All right, come along. Okay, everybody. So let's just remind ourselves what we just saw. What we saw was the beginning stages of how to go ahead and assess water quality through living organisms. So one of the really important things to do when it comes to water quality in our area is to think about how good is the water quality? Is it good enough for all kinds of organisms to live in or just a specific type of organism to live in? If water quality is really good, it has some elements like good water temperature, um, good shading, good oxygenation. So Mr. Jossipo pointed out that in that particular zone called a riffle zone at the edge of that low dam that's kind of falling apart, we see a lot of churning water, what we might even call rapids. And so when you're looking at that, that's a perfect area for organisms that require a highly oxygenated environment to live in. They're able to cling to surfaces like the rocks or sediment so that they don't get washed away down the river, but they're also gaining access to higher levels of oxygen and a little bit of um, you know, mixture up in the water that will allow other organisms to kind of go by that they could prey upon, for example, or to collect um, too. 
So what we're about to see when we're moving forward in this next segment is actually the kick seining technique. So Mr. Jostapol and his students, Nathan and Jake and myself will go out into the river that you see there and we'll set up a kick seine and we'll begin to wipe the rocks off as Mr. Jostapol indicated we should and kind of kick up the sediment in an attempt to loosen up or to release those macro and vermis that might be hiding to the water so that the water will push them into the net for collection purposes. So remember, it's really important again to look at the organisms that live in the water because this gives us a more annual view of the water quality in a particular area. And if organisms are able to live there all year long, then we are able to kind of say, okay, these organisms are more tolerant or less tolerant of certain conditions, and it helps us to gauge or better understand the water quality that we see here in the All Days River. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next video where you see beginning the kick seining process. Oops. Here we go. Sorry for those technical difficulties. So let me review the process one more time. It looks like Jake has set the net at a 45 degree angle to the flow of the river, which is very important. So as the river moves into the net, it will catch the organisms that are suspended in the water. Mr. Jostapol, Nathan, and you can't see me yet, but I'm coming into the picture. We are picking up rocks and carefully wiping them off, trying to unlodge organisms that might be clinging to that particular habitat. Mr. Jostapol is also kicking up the stream sediments, helping to um, take those organisms and push them up into that water so the water will push them into the net. And he indicated that we need about a three by three foot area so that we can go ahead and have a better understanding of what we're collecting. We don't wanna kick outside of the net area. It's important to only be in front of the netting zone. And remember, you're supposed to come to the net downstream, which means below the net and moving forward. And it looks like the water here has got a pretty high velocity. So we wanna be really careful when we're out in the river system. And then again, you saw Jake and Mr. Jostel will go ahead and scoop that net up so that we don't lose anything that we will collect. Our next step then is to take that net up to a landed area. So up on the, on the bank there where we have laid out a white cloth that we can put our net on top of so that we can more easily see the organisms that we're gonna take a look at. Let's look at this next slide here really quick and see if you can kind of get a feel for some of the organisms that you might find in the river. All right, let's look at these organisms, A through H. These are just some images of organisms that are similar to the organisms that we're gonna to find today in the Auglaise River. What are some of the things that you see that may be different or distinctive with these particular organisms that would help you to identify what they are? What's really interesting as you take a look at all these organisms is that they range from jointed legs. So for example, organism A has jointed legs. He has six jointed legs that you see there. Um, to organisms like D, which don't have jointed legs, but instead kind of have these fleshy protrusions that help him move along, which we call prolegs. And so as you're taking a look at all of these organisms, start to see some distinct similarities and some distinct differences that will help you be able to determine what they are. If we go back to the lesson, Can You ID? you will see that there is also on that lesson some identification sheets that will make this process easier for you. So take one more look here at these organisms. These are all organisms that you would find in different levels of water quality, um, primarily good water quality to excellent water quality. Um, and just again, look at some of the differences that you see. If you have your identification sheets in front of you, you can even begin the identification process. And what's really interesting about water quality is we don't really identify to the species of the organism, but instead to the genus of the organism. So there are several species of water penny, for example, or several species of dragonflies, as you know, as you see them flying around in the summertime. But what we know is that all dragonflies have a very similar um, 
a very similar um, symmetry so that you can go ahead and say, okay, for sure, that's a dragonfly um, as you're taking a look at these organisms in front of you. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Now that you have a feel for the organisms that you might collect in your net after kick staining, I want you to also think about what kind of zones could they live in? So as you're looking at this diagram here in front of you, we've really divided these organisms up into three different what we call zones of tolerance or ranges of tolerance within the river system. So you see that on the left, we have called one sensitive, in the middle, somewhat sensitive, and then on the far right, tolerant. So let me explain what those categories mean. Organisms that can only live in a sensitive environment require specific needs to survive. So one of those needs that Mr. Jostable talked about is high levels of oxygen. So you might only find a gilled snail in a ripple zone in a river because it needs high levels of oxygen. Now, other organisms that don't require high levels of oxygen, like a leech, for example, could live in a sensitive zone, but probably will not. You'll probably find a leech in an area of the river that might be really slow moving, perhaps it's also shallow, um, and on the edge. And that leech would be able to exist in a, um, a more tolerant um, area. So let's, let's think about that just a little bit. So what I just said is that you might find a leech with a gilled snail, but you probably won't find a gilled snail in an area that only a leech could tolerate, okay? So it sounds to me like the sensitive organisms have a more narrow range of tolerance than organisms like leeches that could live in a much wider range or zone of the river because they can tolerate um, less sensitive um, characteristics. So for example, higher water temperatures or more turbid waters, which would mean there's more soil that's suspended in the water system. So take a look again at this chart in front of you and get a feel for some of those names that you're gonna see as we go through the identification process. They're kind of strange names. You know, I'm sure you're familiar with clams or snails, but maybe not a helgramite, for example, otherwise known as a dobson fly. So as you're looking at these different genus of organisms in front of you, just remember that some of them can only live in a narrow zone. So for example, only the riffle zone that we saw in the river, whereas other organisms could live in a much wider zone throughout that river and could live um, further downstream or further upstream away from a riffle zone too. Now let's go ahead and refer back to our identification charts that are in the lesson, Can You ID? I want to help you understand how these identification charts are created. Let's take a look here um, at this organism that's here on the top left. Notice that they're showing you that this organism has three distinct parts. And the glossary is just over here on the left-hand side that you can see as well if you're not sure what they're talking about. So for example, insects have a head section, they have a thorax or a main body section, and then they also have an abdomen section. And what's really interesting is since these organisms all live in water systems, they all primarily have some form of gills as well. And many of their gills are on the exterior side of their body. So they're not inside like our lungs are inside, but instead they're actually outside of their body exposed to the oxygen and the water itself. So when you're looking through um, this identification chart, I want you to really pay attention to the areas of the body that you might find something. So for example, you might find the jointed legs on the thorax of the body um, and the type of legs it has, if any. So over here on the right side, you'll see that this organism has distinctly jointed legs um, versus this organism here on the bottom that has a fleshy protrusion, we call it a pro leg, which helps it to move around. The next things that you will do when you're looking at these organisms is to decide, does it have jointed legs or doesn't it? So once you answer that question, there's a few more things that you'll see that you'll go through as you move down through the arrows. 
So notice that if it does not have jointed legs, it might be, if you go down here to page two, um, the organism that we just saw like a crane fly that has fleshy protrusions or prolegs, or perhaps it's a gilled snail or a lung snail or a clam, which also does not have legs or a worm, or even um, a planarian, which I believe Mr. Jostapel found one um, in our search in the Auglaise River. If you're looking here at this page, these are some examples of organisms that do not have jointed legs, but instead have those prolegs or fleshy protrusions that we talked about. Some of these guys are really interesting because they can actually create little casings or houses that they could be a part of. Um, some have more distinct or less distinct heads that you'll see on the posterior or on the anterior ends. So just pay attention to the organism and maybe even get out a magnifying glass as you're looking at it. Um, make sure you have identification cards with you too. All of those things will help you to best identify the organism that you see. Another thing to think about as you're looking at these images on the screen is that you think, oh my gosh, these things are huge. But what you'll see as we are pulling organisms out of the river is that in fact, they might be very small. Um, they might be less than a quarter of an inch or even a half an inch in length. And so you really have to have some practice at identifying these organisms so that you can best quantify your river to see if it has good water quality, poor water quality, or even excellent water quality too. On this particular um, page that you see here, these are some of the ones I think that we're most familiar with as we look at macroinvertebrates in the river. So these are all primarily insects. What you'll see here are caddis flies. So again, here's some distinctly jointed legs, um, also known as net spinners, um, helgramites or dobson flies. These guys can live in the water for over three years and can get really, really big. I've seen them where they're almost you know, half the length of my hand, they can become so big. Um, of course, there's moss and beetles and dragonflies that you'll see in the river too. So let's go ahead and jump back and look again at some images of the organisms that we might see. Here are some examples of stoneflies and mayflies and damselflies. And I want to just point out one thing really quick. When you're looking at some of these organisms, for example, look here at the damselfly, look here at the mayfly, and look here at the stonefly. These are all here on your left. I want you to see that over here on the damselfly, you'll see they have what they call fluffy tail filaments. Those are actually the gills on the damselfly. So one of the easiest ways to determine that it's a damselfly is to look to see if they have gill extensions on their tail filaments or they almost look like feathers that come out. Sometimes there'll be two or three feathers, but they always have feathers and that's the easiest way to identify them. Over here on the mayflies, the mayflies have a heavier body than you see on damselflies, and they also have their gill extensions on the abdomen, whereas on the damselflies, they're down here at the tail. And then over here with the stoneflies, so you don't confuse them with the mayflies, you will see that stoneflies only have two tail filaments. So these are some distinctive characteristics that can help you as you're looking at these organisms, because remember, these organisms are alive and they're going to be moving in the water, trying to get away from you and trying to hide. And so you're gonna have to have a sharp eye as you're looking at them and kind of know what to look for and practice before you go to the river so that you can best identify them. All right, let's take that knowledge that we've gained so far and look at some of these organisms here really quickly. Okay, so as we look at these organisms A through H, remember some of the things we talked about. Where are the gills located? So for instance, in um, organism C that you see, here the gills are located along the abdomen of the organism. On this organism over here, organism F, you also see that the gills are located here up on the thorax and the uppermost part of the abdomen. This particular organism, you see jointed legs, a large predatory head, and some other protrusions here on the abdomen that help that organism move along. 
And finally, over here with organism H, you see feathery tail filaments. So let's just think about what kind of organisms are those? Then here with letters D and letters E, let's compare these two. In letter E, there are jointed legs that are here at the beginning portion here on the thorax and the beginning of the abdomen. Whereas over here with letter D, there are no jointed legs, but instead those fleshy protrusions or those prolegs that help this organism to move around. Okay, let's take a look really quickly at some of the things that we will see as we pull these organisms up out of the river. What you're seeing here is the white sheet with um, the kicksane net on top. And what we're doing at this moment is we're pulling organisms off of the net and see them in the tackle box below. In the tackle box, you're noticing that those organisms are swimming as soon as they get there in the water. And you really have to be careful to make sure that you are pulling everything up out of the net. These organisms will stick to leaves or to algae or anything that happens to also be caught in the net. So as you're looking at your net, remember they're very small, look for movement, and then you can pick those organisms up and you can put them in something like a tackle box that you see below there or an ice cube tray, something that will help you to go ahead and keep those organisms in a safe zone, a water zone, so that you can identify them later and then release them back to their environment. So let's go through a few things just to remind. When you're thinking about water quality, it's important to pick an area where you can get a good indication of how good the water quality is. We use ripple zones because if we're looking for organisms that live in a sensitive zone, that is where you're gonna find them. So as we are quantifying the genus of organisms that you find, it's important to make sure you're also going to the right area to be able to pick those organisms up. Let's go ahead and get a little bit more of an explanation here in this next slide about what the All Glazed River holds in store for us today. Oops. That shows that this water Water's quality better. is really in good but shape. Like, why? Well, that, okay, so a species that you can find just in good water quality, so mayflies, um, is it, is it gilt lung snails? Yeah. Lung snails that go to the right. Those are species that are really sensitive to um, changing conditions. So changing conditions could be change uh, swing big swings of temperature. So the water's so warm that there's less oxygen. So if you were to cut trees down, that would help to rise water temperature. It could also be heavy sediment load. So it could be runoff that could be coming in and causing problems by covering the macroinvertebrates. Um, it could be different nutrient levels. Anything like that that causes adverse conditions in the water quality will make the environment unsuitable for a sensitive organism to live in. So as a consequence, you'll find some organisms that are more tolerant. So we use terms like sensitive and tolerant organisms. So that's not to say that a tolerant organism could not live in good water quality, because it can. But because these are fierce competitors and predators, they will outcompete and push them out of that system. So because this water quality is suitable for sensitive predators mostly, they will actually push organisms that can tolerate less oxygen, higher water temperatures, changing nutrient levels into different zones. And so that's why macroinvertebrates are a great way to determine water quality, primarily because they live in this water all year long. So they tolerate only sensitive water all year long. And so it's kind of like looking at the weather. This is more of a climactic view of the water, more of a long-term view of what the water quality is. As far as the area goes, a lot of our farmers are using no-till practices and conservation practices. Um, we have a lot of grassed waterways in low areas where our farmland dips down. Um, we have a lot of protection going on to keep those pesticides, those, those chemicals like fertilizers, the sediment that comes from agricultural fields 
from getting into the river. And that's a big push since we're in the Lake Erie watershed up here and uh, dealing with the uh, contamination and the algae growth up in the lakes. We always get lots of questions about that. Yep. Well, you know, it's the push around here. It is. There's no Big question. Time. I agree with you completely. All right, you guys. So let's take a look again at what we're seeing in front of us. We're going to review some of those organisms that we saw in the images today and, and listen back a little bit to what Mr. Jostable was telling us. So Mr. Jostable was indicating that, you know, we are in the All Glaze River watershed, which then empties north into the Defiance River watershed and finally up to the Lake Erie River watershed. So it's kind of interesting that this water is actually flowing north as it empties into our Lake Erie watershed. And remember, it's really critical that as farmers, we are keeping nutrients in our fields um, by promoting soil health so that we can make sure that um, materials that should not be going into the river, should not be going up into the lake, are remaining in the fields themselves. So as we're thinking about that, let's go ahead and look at some of the organisms that we saw earlier in our slide deck and start to characterize them into different zones of tolerance. So if you remember organism A, organism A was a dragonfly. So let's just take a look here really quick at the sheet in front of you, okay? And let's find where the dragonfly is. Okay, a dragonfly larvae, as you can see right here, is in the middle zone of somewhat sensitive. So what that means is that that dragonfly could live in all of the first two areas. You could find a dragonfly in the middle zone. So where maybe the water uh, temperature is a little higher or the oxygen levels are slightly lower, um, you could also find a dragonfly in the sensitive zone, but you will not find one and slow moving water that's very warm and that has low oxygen levels because that organism cannot tolerate that. It requires more oxygen than you would find here. Organism B that we saw before was a water penny. So, so far we've seen some organisms that are both in the somewhat sensitive zone, also in the sensitive zone. So that indicates that our water levels have very high levels of oxygen. They're pretty clean, low sediment loads, good temperatures. The next organism that we saw in letter C was a mayfly larvae. And as you can see here above, again, that is a sensitive organism. Now, do you remember that organism that didn't have any jointed legs but had instead those fleshy protrusions? That's a caddisfly larvae that we saw there. So letter D is a caddisfly larvae. And then next to it, Oh, forgive me, that was a crane fly larvae. I said the wrong thing. So that's in the somewhat sensitive zone. But next to it in letter E was the caddis fly larvae. So the caddis fly larvae has the jointed legs and the crane fly larvae does not. You'll have to forgive me there. Then with letter F, we saw an organism that only had two tail filaments. And so that's a very distinctive thing. That is a stone fly larvae. So as we're looking here, the stone fly larvae is in the sensitive zone. Next to that, we had that larger organism that I told you could live in the river for over three years at a time. And that's a helgramite larvae, otherwise sometimes known as a dobson fly. So as you can see here so far, we had could click off caddisfly larvae, helgramites, mayflies. Um, we also saw a stonefly larvae and a water penny um, on the images on the slides. And then finally, with letter H, we had a damselfly larvae. So again, another somewhat sensitive organism that we saw there. And remember, that's characterized by the three um, kind of feathery tail filaments that come out that actually are the gills for that particular organism. So what I'm finding so far with the organisms that we've been able to identify are both sensitive and a few somewhat sensitive organisms. But what we've not seen are any tolerant organisms. So when we think about when we think about the water quality that we have here in the All Glaze River, let's just, just think a little bit about some of the background. We are in the middle of farming country, okay? It was a very large river. We were at a ripple zone, which is important so that we can find the organisms we need to to do this bioassay. And we're also using just a little bit of equipment like a net and something that can contain water and a white sheet. And so when we think about being able to go out to the river and to do an assay of that river to determine, hey, what's the water quality today or maybe tomorrow? 
um, what you'll find is that it's pretty easy to do. But we do have to do a little bit of background and make sure that we are able to identify the organisms that we see there. So let's go on to the next slide here. And we'll talk about what we were able to find in the Auglaize River. Here we go. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the biodiversity index form to rate or to get a water quality um, index value, a total index value of my river. So we've kicked saying the Auglaize River three times now and the organisms that we're finding, I'm gonna check off on this list. So we found caddisflies. So just put an X through there. It's not the number that you find, it's just that you find the species, is, that's what's important. So put an extra caddis fly. So far, no helgramites, but we did find mayfly larvae, gilled snails, riffle beetle adult larves, uh, adults, stonefly larvae, and water pennies. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that is um, six X's that I have. So count them one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm going to multiply six boxes by three and I get an index value for sensitive organisms, that's an 18. All right, did we see any beetle larvae, you guys? I still think some of those are beetle well, larvae. And we found clams yes. and crane fly. Yes. No crayfish though, right? No, not today. Okay, we did find damselfly, correct? Yes. And dragonfly? Yes. No scuds? No. No sow bugs? No. Fish fly, alder fly, or water snipe? No. Okay, so when we categorize this somewhat sensitive column, we're going to do one, two, three, four, five. So five boxes checked by two, and that gives us a rating of 10. We did find aquatic worms, right? Yes. No black fly larvae, leeches, midge larvae, or lung snails. We did find a lung snail. You did find one? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to add these boxes up, one and two, put my number here. Two boxes times one gives me a value of two. Now what I need to do is add these numbers together. So 18 plus 10 is 28 plus two is 30. So you guys, I don't know if I've ever gotten a 30 before. <laughs> I just kind of say that out loud. I really don't think I've ever gotten a yeah. 30 before. That's so impressive. This is a total index value of 30. Probably the highest rating I've ever seen on a river. So it's obviously excellent because it's above a 22. So these are organisms that live in this river all year long. So we know that they are um, sensitive to changing conditions. And what we're finding is that with a rating of 30, this river is over the top good. So this river is right in the middle of farm country, but it's still excellent rating. Okay, so whether it's a little bit of drainage, a little surface runoff, it's still shaded, Farmers with no-till practices are making a big difference on the water quality that we see here. And so the water that's leaving the Auglaize, and where does this where does this one move into? This goes towards Defiance and then into the, the Maumee. Maumee. Yeah, I knew it was part of the Maumee watershed. So this river that's coming out of an agricultural base area and going up into Lake Erie is demonstrating excellent water quality. All right, you guys, so what we were looking at there was a rating of 30. Um, to achieve excellent water quality, we need a 22. So what we saw was that here was a river at the end of the agricultural season, so we're getting ready to move into harvest. There has been some wheat that's probably been pulled off in that area. Um, homeowners themselves are taking care of their own lawns and we're able to capture those nutrients and keep the sediment where it should be so it's not moving into our rivers. Remember, these organisms live in this river all year long. And so as a result, um, we are able to go ahead and do that bioassay of that river and tell us that by indicating that we found those organisms, we also have excellent water quality. Some additional things that you can do to test your water quality in your area are to take some chemical tests. Oftentimes, if you're taking chemical tests, it's kind of like a, a day's window of what that water is like, because as you saw with that river, that water is moving really rapidly downstream. So even if, um, for example, a new such as nitrogen gets into the river, it's going to move pretty rapidly downstream and not remain in a certain spot. So that's one of the reasons why we like macroinvertebrate testing so much better because those organisms stay in that spot all year long.
Okay, so I'm so excited to tell you guys that the All Glaze River in Putnam County has fantastic water quality. I mean, we should be really proud of that. And as that water is moving north into the Lake Erie Basin, it's really not contributing at all to some poor water quality issues that you can utilize up there. So if we all do a good job, you know, if we're all making sure we're practicing sustainable practices like um, best management practices such as no-till farming, precision agricultural techniques and agricultural science, um, as well as things like filter strips, et cetera. What we're seeing is that water quality is improving across the state and farmers as well as homeowners are all working hard to improve water quality um, as we're moving um, forward because we know it's really important. We wanna make sure that we're maintaining healthy ecosystems, we're maintaining healthy soil profiles, and we're also of course maintaining healthy water systems. So I just want to close here today, you guys, with a thank you to um, Fort Jennings High School and Mr. Jostable, especially to all his students. Uh, Mr. Jostable is a wonderful teacher, and you're very, very lucky to have him. We really appreciate him um, at Ohio Corn and Weed and at Feed the World especially. Um, and I want to take um, some time for you to think about tomorrow. So as you can see, next up in our Feed and Fuel Your Career series, we're going to host an interactive career panel. Um, in that interactive career panel, you can listen in, you can ask questions, um, and industry experts will share their career pathways with you and their expertise that they have in case you are interested in some career in agricultural science. So we are glad to have you. We hope that you can join us, and we want to make sure that you have a fantastic day. Thank you so much for, taking, uh, for joining us today, and take care.